morning, everyone, and welcome to all of our Lab Day guests. I'm Harry Arf, Senior Vice President for Research at Mass General, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to Lab Day 2020. You know, in my role at MGH, I'm privileged to oversee Mass General's research enterprise. That's an enterprise where more than 9,500 people, and these consist of physicians, physician scientists, PhD investigators, nurses, technologists, engineers, and many other specialists. They all collaborate every day uh, on the interdisciplinary research teams to bring research breakthroughs to you from the laboratory to patient bedsides. But we don't do it alone. Indeed, we can't do it alone. It's our supporters, visionary philanthropists, like those who support the MGH Research Scholars and the MGH Research Endowed Chairs. Um, it's your generosity that fuels the saving, the life-saving discoveries that are underway at the MGH Research Institute. Now, to all of you who have attended Lab Day before, uh, we're very glad to see that you're back. Uh, we've missed you, and uh, we miss certainly seeing you on campus. And we look forward to having you back here at MGH when it's once again safe to do so, uh, to have visitors in our research labs. And to the folks who are joining us for the first time today, uh, we're thrilled that you're here. Lab Day is a truly unique and special experience. It's a special opportunity to learn about the biomedical research at the Mass General Research Institute. I can't imagine a better introduction to our work. So after today's event, I hope you'll agree, and I hope that you'll join us again, hopefully in person next year at Lab Day 2021. And now it's my pleasure to turn Lab Day over to Dr. Sue Slagenhoff, your Lab Day host. Dr. Slagenhoff is the Scientific Director of the Mass General Research Institute. She is also the Elizabeth G. Riley and Daniel E. Smith Jr. Endowed MGH Research Institute Chair and has formerly been the Elizabeth G. Riley and Daniel E. Smith Jr. MGH Research Scholar from 2013 to 2018. Uh, and with that, I'll say a quick hello to Elizabeth and Dan. Um, it's great to see you out there tuning in from Rhode Island. So Sue, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you all and welcome again to Lab Day. Thanks so much, Harry. I'm so pleased to join Harry in welcoming all of you here today for our virtual Lab Day. We wish we could be hosting you in person, but we're really excited about this virtual event featuring, featuring some of our MGH research scholars. As your lab day guide, I'm watching our virtual guest list, and I want to say a special hello to a few people. We have several people here who have attended our annual lab day three years in a row. So a special welcome to Richard Aparo, Sam and Anna Knight, Dave Ryder, and Ming Ming Zhao. We're really thrilled that you keep coming back to visit us at Mass General. I also see some special friends of Mass General are attending their first lab day. So a special hello and welcome to Rick Frisbee, Janet and Wilbur James, and Peter and Paula Lunder. I also see that several members of our Research Institute Advisory Council have joined us today, including Britt Darbeloff, Scott Esten, Jim Cash, Elizabeth Riley, and Mike Rosenblatt. So I'm sending a very warm welcome to these special friends of the Mass General Research Institute. Before we get started, let's run through a few virtual housekeeping items. First, today is a mix of live and pre-recorded conversations. So you'll want to make sure that you close any other web pages or apps that you have running so you get the best virtual experience. At any point during lab day, you can submit questions for us using the Q&A button on your screen. You can do this anonym anonymously if you like, um, and we really hope that you'll participate. And again, you can send questions in for us at any time during lab day. And we'll talk a little more about that. Lab day will be recorded. So um, we will send you a shareable link and we really hope that you will share it broadly with your networks and help us spread the word about the amazing research going on at Mass General. So let's now run through the plan for the day. Part one of the lab day is the tours. Dr. Jay Rajagopal and Dr. Kate Jeffrey will each share a live introduction, one of them in their basement, the other in their attic. 
and then they will take you with me on a virtual tour of their laboratories. And for me, I should tell you that I am right now sitting in a friend of mine's daughter's bedroom um, coming to you live because of a power outage that we had yesterday after the storms. So um, we are very uh, resilient here at the Mass General Research Institute in bringing this event to you. After we have both tours, um, we will then return back here live for the question and answer session with Jay and Kate. And um, again, be sure to submit the questions as they come up during the lab tours. Part two of Lab Day is our COVID-19 panel. Mass General Research Institute Advisory Council Scott member Scott Esten will moderate the COVID-19 panel with Drs. Galit Alter, Dr. Andy Chan, Dr. Luana Marquez, and Dr. Rochelle Walensky. These experts, all recipients of MGH Research Scholar Awards, are leading COVID-19 research at Mass General on disease epidemiology, on vaccines, and mental health. So get your questions ready. Last but not least, I want to make sure that you're wearing your ID badge, that you'll need for the tours, and that you have your program and your maps handy. We also spent, sent each of you a very special gift. So I hope that you're enjoying some coffee, tea, or other beverage of your choice in your special beaker mug in the comfort of your own home. So with that, let's get going. I'm going to turn it over now to our first tour host, Dr. Jay Rajagopal, who will get us started. Jay? Hello, it's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you, Sue, for that very nice introduction. Uh, Sue asked us to start out with a little biography of ourselves. So I can tell you uh, that I've been around Mass General for a long, long time. It turns out that I was an undergraduate at Harvard. Harry Orff, our VP now, was the administrator of the small group I was in in molecular biology. My first boss was actually Jack Shostak, who won the Nobel Prize not so long ago. And then it turns out that the graduate student that was teaching me was Jen Doudna, who won the Nobel Prize yesterday. So I can't impress upon you how amazing an environment this is to learn. I then personally went off to medical school after finishing undergraduate, then became a resident where the diseases seemed kind of familiar. Uh, and we were taking care of people knowing what we were doing. And then I became a specialist in pulmonary medicine and things got much, much more complicated. A lot of the diseases that we were discussing and treating were really things that were entirely mysterious to me. So what we decided to do with the support of all these great people at Mass General was that I would go back to Harvard University actually and work with someone who studied the frog and studied the pancreas, which was an unusual decision, but I think it's the kind of thing that Mass General supports. And I went to that unusual environment so I could learn how to deal with cells. And then I came back here and started my own lab some 10 years ago. Um, and during that time, it was wonderful to be a Moroni research scholar because that gave me the flexibility to start working on uh, the lung. Um, so now I'd like to tell you a little bit about what we do. Um, and I'll try to share my screen with you. I hope you can see that. Um, and what we work on, as I said, is stem cells and lung disease. And uh, what you see in front of you is a picture of the airway epithelium. But that is, those are the cells that line the inside of your airway. And amazingly enough, this airway epithelium we made from the skin of a patient, uh, a cystic fibrosis patient. Uh, but I wanted to show you on this next slide that really the king of stem cells for patients is the hematopoietic stem cell. Uh, this is the cell that makes all your blood. You see it at the top of this very complicated set of cells. And the most remarkable and amazing thing about it is not just its biology, but that we can move cells from one person, a normal person, into a relative or a, a, another patient who may have leukemia. And we can entirely replace the blood of, of those patients. We want to be able to do such things with other organs. Well, this is that airway epithelium I told you about. It looks very simple. There are only three cells there, uh, um, a stem cell, a cell that makes mucus, and a ciliated cell. But what I found shortly after working with a set of colleagues at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and the Broad Institute in particular, that it's much more complicated than that. And just last year, we understood that the epithelium looks much more like this cartoon. 
And if you look at the next page, you can see that we've mapped out these cells and that now things look a lot more like they do in the blood system. There's a whole set of complicated cells, each of which do different things, and we're only just beginning to understand them. But you can see how stuck we were as pulmonologists trying to teach people, uh, trying, trying to treat people with lung disease because we didn't even know what cells comprise their lung. I'll just tell you about one really remarkable cell, which is the ionocyte. The reason this is so remarkable is no one had any idea that it existed for decades and decades, uh, and our studies with the Broad Institute reveal that it does. But it's a very special cell, it's very rare, and strangely and surprisingly, it carries all of the genes for cystic fibrosis, the cystic fibrosis gene itself. And so I wanted to show you this one very simple slide. It was one of the most amazing days in our laboratory. Uh, one of my graduate students called me into the tissue culture hood, which you'll see a little bit later with one of my postdoctoral fellows. But we were growing epithelium in these dishes, you can see. And on the left, I think you can see those cells look kind of flat and with a matte finish. And on the right, I think you can see that the cells have this little bit of a glistening surface. And my graduate student just asked me to look at hundreds and hundreds of wells. And I was able to say, this looks like these matte cells and this looks like these glisteny cells. And it turned out, once he revealed to me his spreadsheet, all of the glisteny cells were the ones without ionocytes. Um, then I was able to work with another scientist at Mass General, this time an engineer named Gary Tierney, and we were able to look at ultrasound on these glisteny cells. And what you can see in the bottom panels is suddenly the amount of mucus and surface fluid uh, are much increased. And that's not unlike the way it is in cystic fibrosis. So it may be that cystic fibrosis is a very, very different disease than we think it is. We still have to do all these experiments in humans, but that's one example of the way uh, we're trying to make a difference by learning the cells of the lung so then we could learn more about the diseases of the lung. And with that brief introduction, um, I thought Sue and I would now take you to go see the lab and some of the young scientists that I work with. So we'll go ahead and do that now. Hi everyone, welcome again to Lab Day. This is the Richard B. Sinkis Research Center, and this is a remarkable building. We have over 100 labs in this building, and every day over 1,200 scientists come to work here. I cannot wait to take you upstairs. Before I do, however, I need to change my mask. Everyone who comes into the building here needs to wear an MGH-issued mask, and we have them in this dispenser, and you'll see something like this if you come to the hospital for an appointment. Just pull out my mask. And we're set to go. Don't forget, everyone needs to have their badge to access the labs. Here we are at the MGH Center for Regenerative Medicine, where they study how tissues are formed and how they might be repaired after disease or injury. So let's go in and find Jay. Hey, Jay. Hi, Sue. Come on in. Thanks for coming. Yes. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. And welcome to the Simkis Research Building. So tell us a little bit about what goes on in the Center for Regenerative Medicine. Well, as you heard a little bit, in the center, we study stem cells. And my lab, in particular, studies the lung. And we study regeneration. And so we study lung stem cells. And ultimately, what we're really looking for is cures for lung disease. Great. Well, let's head in. OK, let's go see our colleagues. After you, Sue. Hi, Avinash. How are you? Hey, Jay. How are you? Do you have a second? Yeah, sure. You know Sue, and I wanted oh, to nice introduce to see you. I wanted to introduce you to all our guests. Hi, everyone. Um, Avinash came here to study lung stem cells, and then COVID happened, and he really pivoted his research program. Why don't you tell us about that, Avinash? Sure, Jay. Um, so in Jay's lab, we are interested in how 
uh, the cellular machinery of the lung affects normal lung function and also what role they may play in lung disease. Um, so we, with that in mind, we sort of set out to map all of the different cells in normal as well as diseased lungs. And that led to the discovery of uh, a couple of new cell types that play a role in cystic fibrosis as well as in other diseases like asthma. Um, and as Jay mentioned, uh, COVID happened. And then we were able to deploy our large data set to help researchers around the world as part of an international consortium to help identify the cells in the lung that the virus infects. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Avinash. Thank you. PC room. Okay. Hi, Brian. How are you? Do you have a minute? Yeah, give me one second. I'd like to introduce you to Sue. Hi, Brian. And to all our guests out there. Nice to meet you. Uh, and I wanted to tell you a little bit about Brian. Brian came to the lab with a lot of expertise on the stem cells in the nose that create the tissue that give you rhinitis and colds. And then Brian wanted to come to us and study stem cells of the lung. And he's asking this really deep question about what does it actually mean to be a stem cell? So Brian, can you tell us? Yeah, so we recently found that uh, the trachea has a lot of rare cells in it. And that these stem cells have to make a very uh, careful balance of these rare cells. Um, we implicated them in human disease, such as cystic fibrosis and asthma. Um, and so the balance that these stem cells strike is kind of what we're interested in. Um, and so what I'm studying is kind of how do these stem cells know how many of these rare cells to make? Um, and to kind of get inspiration for this pretty difficult problem, uh, I'm looking at kind of a universal theme across all the stem cells in the body. Um, so hopefully that kind of gives us more of a broad overview about how this might be happening. Great. Thanks, Brian. That's terrific. We're off to go see Manali now. Great. Okay, thanks, Brian. Yeah, of course. Um, can you turn off the lights on your way out? I will. Thank you. Take care. Hello, Minali. How are you? I'm doing well. Hi. I'd like to introduce you to Sue Slagenhoff. So nice to meet you. Of course, we're speaking to all these folks today. Uh, I'm very proud of Minali because Minali comes to us from India where she won the Inspiring Young Graduate Student Award. And she did this very interesting work about infections and how they affect pregnant women who are carrying. And because of her interest in infections, she decided to come to our lab and study pulmonary infections. That's right. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. Uh, so I'm interested in understanding how does the airway epithelium sense and respond to various environmental allergens, toxins, and infectious agents. Our lab has already shown that the airway epithelium comprises of different kinds of cells with specialized structure and function. Uh, but we have come across unique airway epithelial cells that can specifically sample antigens and pathogens and present it to the immune system of our body. Having studied infectious disease biology back uh, in my PhD days in India, I joined the Rajagopal lab to expand our mechanistic understanding of various lung diseases like pneumonia and tuberculosis which we believe is very important for uh, and fundamental for better management of respiratory health. Thanks, Manali. Thanks. Great introduction. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Nice cool. to meet you. Nice meeting you. See too. you later. Have a good day. See ya. After you, Sue. Well, Jay, thank you so much for that tour. It was really great meeting all the people in your lab. We really appreciate it. And um, I know our science can be pretty complicated, but so if you had one take home message for our guests about your work, what would that be? Well, I think when I started naively, I thought understanding the cells of the lung would teach us something about disease. And it turns out that that was more true than I ever could have imagined. Because every day we're kind of reframing what lung disease is all about. Thanks, Jay. And we really appreciate, again, you opening your lab to us. So, okay, everyone, um, I know you probably have lots of questions for Jay, so please use the Q&A button on your screen, send in your questions. We're going to go back now live to Lab Day, where we're going to meet the host of our next tour, and then Jay will be back with us for our live question and answer session after. So um, we'll see you in a minute.
Hi, everyone. Um, I hope you can all hear me. Um, what a pleasure to be here at uh, MGH Lab Day. I want to say we had so much fun shooting these videos for you. Um, so a little about me. So I am Kate Jeffrey, and I'm absolutely thrilled to be an MGH Research Scholar for 2020 to 2025. Uh, so unlike Jay, I came a little bit further to come to MGH. Uh, I was born in Australia. Uh, I did my studies at the University of Melbourne and then I moved up to Sydney, uh, Australia to do my PhD in immunology there with uh, Professor Charles Mackay. And after I finished my PhD, I then jumped on a plane by myself with two suitcases uh, with a fellowship from the Australian government to do my postdoctoral uh, research work at the Rockefeller University uh, in New York. And that's where I really um, pivoted to this understanding of uh, epigenetics, which I'll talk a little bit about today, and the way in which epigenetics can actually contribute to these complex inflammatory diseases, such as uh, inflammatory bowel disease. Um, so with that, I will uh, share some slides um, and begin to tell you a little bit about what we do. Okay, so hopefully you can all see um, these slides. Um, so the goal of my lab um, is really to understand complex human immune disease um, and really in the post-genomic era. So after we've sequenced all the DNA, what do we understand about these complex diseases? And it turns out that actually genes are a little bit involved in these diseases, but actually there's a huge environmental component and a huge uh, epigenetic component. So solving complex immune disorders in 2020, uh, I think we are all acutely aware of the infectious now. Um, so, you know, the good news is, is that most infectious diseases are really, their rates have decreased dramatically over the years. So if you look at tuberculosis, measles, hepatitis, um, these rates of infections are all dramatically going down. And that's because we know the source of these infections. We know the pathogen, and then we can make a vaccine against it. So the best example will be SARS-CoV-2 or COVID, and eventually we will have a vaccine and we'll be able to eliminate this disease. The more complex immune diseases though, and by that I mean things like multiple sclerosis, inflammatory bowel disease, type one diabetes and allergies. These diseases are not caused by a single trigger. They're not an infectious disease. We don't have a single pathogen. And there's this real sort of complex, uh, combination of genetics and environment uh, that, that trigger these diseases. And so the challenge for us immunologists is when we don't know the exact trigger, is trying to understand how do our immune cells go awry, why do they start misdirecting their responses and actually lead to inflammation. And the one thing about inflammatory bowel disease that's quite alarming is that rates have doubled uh, in less than 20 years. And every year right now, about 100,000 Americans are being diagnosed newly with inflammatory bowel disease. So this is when your immune cells in the gut, for some reason, start to trigger inflammation in the intestine. And what's interesting about this disease is that the rates of uh, this disease are particularly high in my homeland of Australia and also in the United States, as well as many Western industrialized countries. So there's something about living in Western industrialized environments that somehow triggers this disease. So what does this have to do with epigenetics and what is epigenetics? So epigenetics is really the interplay between environment and our genes. And the way that epigenetics works is that every cell in your body has the exact same strand of DNA. So how is it that a skin cell or a liver cell or Jay's lung cells have such an individual gene expression program to say an immune cell? And so the way is that this works is that DNA is packaged within your cells and it's wrapped around these things called histones. And these histones have these chemical tags on them, which tells genes to be on or off. And that is really key because these tags can actually be influenced by our environment. So the best way I can explain epigenetics is using the analogy of a piano. So this is my grandmother, Kathleen Jeffrey. Uh, my namesake. So she was actually a, a professional uh, pianist. Um, and uh, if you consider DNA of all 88 keys of, of a piano, so every cell in your body has all 88 keys, epigenetics is actually playing 
only a number of those keys at a certain time, at the right time, in the right moment. Um, and that is uh, essentially how epigenetics controls the way in which your genes are expressed in the right way. And what we're understanding is that what can happen uh, in cancer, as well as inflammatory disease, that our epigenetics goes awry and it can actually start turning on genes that should not be turned on. What's interesting about epigenetics is if you look at monozygotic twins, so those that have the exact same genetic makeup, studies have been done to show that the, by the time a monozygotic twin are 65 years of age, almost 70% of their epigenetics in their immune cells is actually coming from the environment. So you can imagine how the environment in which you live can actually start to change the gene expression in your immune cells and change the way in which your immune cells behave. And sometimes this can actually trigger uh, inflammation like inflammatory bowel disease. So what's really cool about epigenetics is that actually some of the enzymes or the piano players um, are actually uh, druggable. Um, and we can use these drugs to try and reset gene expression back to normal. So some work we did um, was to show that actually we could find a chemical compound to this uh, piano players. And the use of this chemical compound could actually dramatically reduce inflammation and reset gene expression in immune cells back to normal. Another aspect of epigenetics that we're looking at is actually we found a direct mutation in an epigenetic enzyme called SP140 uh, that triggers inflammatory bowel disease. So this was uh, with a great uh, cohort at Mass General Hospital. So all the patients with inflammatory bowel disease, we could show that a number of these had a loss of this epigenetic uh, enzyme. And that actually resulted in uh, enhanced uh, inflammation uh, in these patients. And so this is an interesting one because here we seem to have a trigger of a loss of an epigenetic enzyme in inflammatory bowel disease. So how can we use uh, precision medicine to try and rescue these patients using epigenetic drugs. And the sort of last main focus of the lab is really understanding those environmental cues that might change our epigenetics and make an immune cell become more inflammatory. And so one environmental cue that we're working on is something that's really new, and this has been a new frontier for my lab, and this is called the virome. So we've known for many, many years that bacteria happily live in our intestines, but only recently have we discovered that viruses are there as well. And of course, we're all scared of one particular virus, SARS-CoV-2, but there's plenty of good viruses that happily live amongst us. But what we found in inflammatory bowel disease is that these are the virome changes and can actually be more damaging. And so you start to have the emergence of these viruses in the gut that are what we're trying to understand is how the virome can actually change our epigenetics, change those chemical tags on those histones that change gene expression, and how does that ultimately lead to inflammatory bowel disease. So I guess our big picture of understanding these complex immune disorders is really understanding this triad of the host genetics. So we know if in the case of inflammatory bowel disease, there's about a mutation of about 160 genes that associate with, with this disease. But this has to come along with the environment in which you live. So there's this combination of, of uh, genetics and environment. And environment, I mean things like diet or smoking or, your, or the bacteria in your gut. And we're trying to understand how epigenetics sort of uh, combines these two and acts as the interface uh, to really lead to uh, inflammation in the gut. And so one example I gave you is this mutation within an epigenetic enzyme that actually more we've been looking at this environmental trigger such as the virome in our guts and how that can change our epigenetics and make immune cells more inflammatory. So with that, I'll take you uh, in with Sue and we'll start our, um, our lab tour, which I said we, you know, we really had a lot of fun shooting this, so I hope you enjoy. So Kate, thanks so much for inviting us into your lab today as part of Lab Day. We're so excited to learn more about what you do. And as we walk towards the Thea Research Building, where your lab is, I can't help but notice we're right across from the main hospital. Um, I, I, wonder, I find myself wondering how many of our patients understand the massive uh, research enterprise here at Mass General and what kind of work we do here. Yeah, I mean, it's a fantastic point. I think this is one of the main draws as a researcher to Mass General Hospital, the proximity to the physicians, to the surgeons, to the patients, and of course, patient samples that they're willing to donate 
that really enables us to perform cutting edge research, trying to understand human disease at the site where these patients are being treated. Great, thanks Kate. So my lab, I'm an immunologist and my lab is particularly interested in understanding chronic inflammatory diseases, but particularly inflammatory bowel disease. So this is essentially when the immune system kind of is overactive in the gut and it leads to painful inflammation and uncomfort. Um, and essentially the only treatment we have right now is cutting that inflamed intestine out. So what we're trying to understand is what can be a trigger for inflammatory bowel disease and really the key point is how can we try and treat this disease in a much better fashion than we are currently. Great. Well, we can't wait to see what you're doing and let's head on in. Okay, so welcome to the Kate Jeffrey Lab at MGH. Has everyone got their lab rules, their map and their badge? Um, I'm going to take you through our lab, show you my international team of mostly women scientists as we try and um, crack some problems related to inflammatory bowel disease. Great. Okay, so I'm going to introduce you to Hadra Amatula, who's a postdoctoral scientist in my lab, and she's going to tell you a bit about what she's doing. Hi, um, so I'm examining a um, Crohn's disease patient with an epigenetic enzyme that is mutated um, called SB140, and we're understanding how loss of this enzyme leads to an imbalance in the immune response to gut bacteria and how that leads to chronic intestinal inflammation. Uh, we're also working towards a molecular understanding of how this enzyme works, what happens when it's lost, and how can we use this knowledge for precision medicine in IBD. Uh, what's exciting about working at MGH is that we have access to patient samples that enable us to really tease out mechanism of SB40 in humans with disease, and that's where um, we get many unexpected directions of research, which is the exciting bit of what I do. Wow, it does sound exciting. Thanks so much. It sounds like the key is being here at Mass General and having access to these patient samples. Yeah, we wouldn't be able to do this anywhere else. Great. Thanks Thank so you. much. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to go now into the tissue culture hood and see what Isabella, my graduate student, is up to. Isabella. Hi. Hi, Isabella. I'm a Harvard Immunology graduate student in the Jeffrey Lab, and I'm studying the role of the epigenetic enzyme SP140 in an immune cell type called the macrophage. So macrophages are part of the first line of defense against the host response to dangerous bacteria and viruses. Uh, however, it's important that macrophages do not become overactive, in which case they may lead to chronic inflammation and disease. And so we're super excited about working in this field of epigenetics, especially in immune cells, because epigenetic enzymes are druggable, and this represents an exciting new avenue for therapy, for treating chronic inflammation. Um, so I've got to get back to my macrophages now. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Isabella. Thank you. Okay, so now I'm introducing you to Fatima. So Fatima is actually an MD who's come from Iran. Uh, and Fatima has taken on a whole new project in my lab, and that is looking at uh, viruses, some that are harmful and some that are damaging uh, in our intestine. Hi. Uh, as Kate said, uh, I'm working on gut viruses in inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, we know a lot about the bacteria part of our microbiome. We just recently found out that we have also viruses and fungi in our gut. Being here at MGH, we have, a with, in a collaboration with colorectal surgeons, we have access to these fresh colon resection samples coming from non-IBD and IBD patients. What I'm doing in the lab, I'm isolating viruses from these uh, resection samples, and I'm looking at the interaction between the host and these viruses. And it's very interesting to know that not all viruses are bad. We know that we have many viruses in our intestine. They are happily live inside us. And even sometimes they are beneficial to us. And finally, the uh, eventual goal is pushing this finding to the clinic and maybe use viruses as a trap in IBD. And that, is this what you're looking at here? Are these viruses from mm -hmm. patients? Yes, this is one of the ways that we quantify the viruses that I'm isolating from that colon resection samples. Cool. All right, thank you, Fatima. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Kate, thanks so much for having us in your lab today. It's been really exciting to learn about your work. Um, I know all of our work can sound really complicated sometimes, so if you had to boil it down to one thing you wanted our Lab Day guests to remember, what would that be? 
Yeah, I want you to remember that epigenetics is like the piano player of our genes, uh, turning the right genes on and keeping the right genes off. And particularly in immune cells, this is absolutely critical for them to do their protective function. But when this goes wrong, like we lose an epigenetic enzyme called SP140, that can actually trigger inflammation in IBD. Um, and we know that these, this piano player also responds to environmental stimuli like viruses. So we think epigenetics is a really exciting avenue uh, for controlling inflammation and resetting things back to normal. Thanks again, Kate. All right, Lab Day guests, we're going to be back live in just a minute. So get ready with your questions. Use the Q&A button on your screens. And we will have Kate and Jay with us live to answer your questions. And we really look forward to it. Thanks for joining us in the Jeffrey Lab. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So we're back live. I, I have to be, I have to tell you all something. That was actually the first time I watched those videos. I don't know if they were trying to keep them from me or not, but I think they came out great. So Kate and Jay, I really want to thank you for letting us into your lab. It might not be quite the same as our guests being there in person, but I definitely think it was an interesting behind the scenes view. So um, I want to encourage everyone to keep the questions coming. We've received several already. Uh, please send us your questions about um, Jay or Kate's work. And uh, let's get this started. We have a few minutes um, to, to have them answer some questions. So um, this first question is actually for, um, for Jay. And um, one of our guests writes, are, there are so many, are many of the specific cell types that you found in the lung also found in other organs and other places in the body? Thanks. That's actually, it's a fantastic question. It's actually a deep interest of mine. Um, it turns out that all of the various so cells in the lung, each special one of the 10 or 11 or so that we found, occur in different smatterings of organs, depending on which one. So, for example, the ciliated cell that moves mu mucus out of your lung also moves an egg down the fallopian tube. On the other hand, the mucus cell of the airway that generates the stuff that you make when you have a cough also lines the inside of the intestine. That very special cell I told you about, the ionocyte, that happens to occur in the kidney and actually the inner ear and helps you with balance. So it's really a terrific question. There's some kind of very deep evolutionary conservation in the way all our organs are built. And one of the reasons that's so interesting is we found that when you learn something in one organ, you learn that same thing in many, many different organs. So when one of my colleagues finds something new in kidney disease or liver disease, it almost certainly has an impact on us. And it is one of the great things about being in this environment. Thanks, Jay. Um, we have another question where someone asked Kate if maybe you could explain um, in a little more detail or with a little more clarity, the virome. What do you mean by the, the virome? Yeah, so, it's, uh, so the virome are the collection of viruses uh, that live uh, in your gut and actually in similar to Jay's theme in other tissues uh, in your body as well. Um, and so really we've known about bacteria for many, many years in our, in our gut, beneficial bacteria. Um, but only through recent sequencing technologies have we understood that viruses are also there. And so when I say the virome, I refer to the collection of those viruses in the gut. So some of those viruses um, are called phages. So they live within the bacteria in your gut. And some of them are actually regular viruses that live within human cells. And so this is a really new field. Um, all we know right now is that the virome changes in patients with inflammatory bowel disease. So it's correlative. Um, and now what we're trying to understand is are they triggering disease? Is this change in the virome a trigger for inflammatory bowel disease? And does this change the behavior of our immune cells to make them more inflammatory? Um, and so that's, you know, we have some fantastic data on that. Um, and this paper is currently being reviewed. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a really new field and really exciting avenue for, for trying to understand uh, immune disease and many other diseases, actually. Thanks, Kate. Um, we, have a, we must have a scientist in our audience because this question asks, um, is there a place in patients' care with pulmonary disease for autophagy? 
Oh, that's a great question. Yeah. Uh, for those uh, viewers that don't know, autophagy is this bio fundamental biological process where when a cell is stressed, it eats parts of itself to kind of gain energy. The classic example in lung disease is actually the autophagy pathway is manipulated to deal with infections. But that's a very special kind of eating. Um, but it turns out that autophagy is probably involved in almost every kind of lung disease in one way or another because there's wear and tear and there's damage. The cells get stressed and they have to respond. So one interesting one, for example, is I think I showed you those cilia that help propel mucus out of the body. Those cilia can actually get shorter, for example. But there are things that happen in every cell and we haven't really defined them yet um, at all. The other part of that question is, does aging play a role in lung disease? And it almost certainly does. I mean, one of the most horrible lung diseases that we see in the clinic is called idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Idiopathic means you don't know what it causes it. Um, and you just wind up getting scar in your lung. Um, but it turns out that if you look at an 80 year old or a 90 year old, the edges of their lung have that scar. So now one way to think about pulmonary fibrosis is that it's a premature aging disease. But that kind of thinking can really have an impact on every lung disease and the way we think about it. COVID is an interesting one. You know, young children um, don't get COVID. And again, so there's an age related or don't get a severe COVID. And uh, part of the reason is because the receptor uh, for that virus is not on in the same cells in, in as high a degree as it is in older folks. So, you know, I think the cells of the lung and the fundamental cellular processes are going to be involved in every lung disease. Thanks, Jay. Um, this question is for you, Kate. Uh, one of our guests asked if you could um, believe or give your thoughts on the Western environmental factors that might be at work in causing such an explosion of IBD. Um, so I think the term believe is a very interesting one to put to a scientist. I think we believe based on fact and we believe based on our data. Um, what do I, what do we know about environmental triggers in a Western environment? Well, we know for sure it's our diet. Uh, we know for sure that the diet in turn changes our microbiome and possibly our virome in the gut and that those connections actually really what can lead to inflammation. So, um, think about a, you know, a Western diet um, of reduced fiber. I think fiber is the key. That's one thing we're learning is that less and less fiber in our diets and more processed foods um, is really a problem and is really changing this balance of healthy bacteria and healthy viruses and beneficial um, viruses and bacteria in our gut. Um, so that's probably the major trigger. Um, there is connection with smoking, but you know, not as many people smoke. Uh, thank goodness. Um, uh, you know, so it's really those two factors. We know that antibiotics has had, you know, long-term antibiotic use has had some connections with changing our microbiome and changing um, these beneficial effects in the gut. So that's the that's the sort of three main ones. But I would emphasize the diet. Um, really, the, the rates of inflammatory bowel disease are extremely low in, you know, in countries like Japan, for example. Um, and so, you know, that, that is, that's the key. And I would just emphasize the fiber component. So eat your fiber. There you go. You heard it from the, an expert. Eat your fiber, everyone. Um, Jay. Let's see. Oh, this is an interesting question that relates to the first one. And that is about um, how did you use the pancreas or the relate your, your studies in pancreas for your pulmonary cell studies? Uh, that's an interesting question. I mean, yeah. I think, you know, when I was a pulmonary fellow and I realized when you looked at pathology slides that people just didn't understand the cells of the lung. So they were using like these descriptive terms, but they really had no idea what those cells were. And so I thought that I needed to understand how to learn about cells better. And there was this area of biology called developmental biology, which figures out how an embryo makes its cells. And it was a very, very rich area of biology, but no one did that in the lung. Uh, and it turns out that Doug Melton at the undergraduate campus 
actually worked on frogs and tried to figure out how they had heads and tails. But then his kids developed diabetes and he decided that he should start studying the pancreas. So it was this perfect role model who was moving from basic biology into a disease relevant organ. So I just thought it would be a great place to learn how to deal with cells. And I did that. And Doug was very uh, fortunate. I mean, it was very fortunate to go to his lab. He's a friend of the Mass General and there's been a lot of interplay. And at the end of my postdoctoral fellowship there, Doug started to let me work on the lung. Uh, and that allowed me to transition into my own laboratory. Great, thanks Jay. Um, it was really great when we visited your labs to meet um, your international uh, postdocs and graduate students and others. And um, I wanted to know if you could each talk a minute about um, how do we attract our best investigators to come to Mass General, researchers and postdocs, et cetera. How do you attract them to come to your labs? And then what are the challenges that we have in keeping them at Mass General? I don't know who wants to go, I'll ask Kate to go first. Okay, I can start. Um, so how does one attract people to Mass General and to your lab? I think, you know, by doing great research, um, you know, I think for me, I really value being a good mentor. I think the success of my career has benefited from those that were generous enough to give their time and their energy towards my career. And so I feel like that's a really important aspect now that I'm in this position to mentor the next generation. And particularly as a woman scientist and a particularly, you know, one that's not from America as well, I think, um, you know, that's really important to me. And I think I just want to emphasize what a week in science it's been. We just had a Nobel Prize given to two women, which is unheard of. So, you know, I think my motivation for attracting people to my lab is that women can do it. We can be scientists and I'm going to mentor you and I'm going to ensure that you're successful. And we're doing really exciting and fun things in the lab. And why come to Mass General? Because we get to have that really great balance of what Sue and I were talking about. You know, I'm a basic immunologist, understanding those basic mechanisms, but we have this like great array or fantastic array of patient samples that we can really do meaningful you know, human disease-based research using those samples. So we, and on top of that, you know, that's that layer. And then we've got Boston, you know, which is essentially the, you know, it is the epicenter of research in the whole world. So where else would you want to be to be doing this top level research? So how do we get to keep them here? Well, we have fantastic uh, programs like the Mass General Research Scholar and fantastic donations from people that enable us to continue our research and also to, you know, sort of train our mentees to uh, apply for grants and how to fund your lab and, and stay within this environment. Thanks, Kate. Jay. I would echo everything uh, that Kate said. I think she was spot on. Um, another just general thing I would say is, you know, the reason it's hard to leave a place like Mass General is people, period. And those people are come in various buckets. I mean, one are just your colleagues, like knowing that Kate is next door is just fantastic. I can always pick up the phone. And I think trainees understand that, you know, they're not just going to your lab, they're going to this unbelievably rich community of scientists. And I know Kate feels this way, but all of my own postdoctoral fellows have other mentors. And some of those mentors are other scientists at Mass General, but some of them are at uh, MIT. And, and so there's just this community. And then as Kate mentioned, the third bucket of people that are unbelievably important, maybe the most important are the patients. Uh, and when you have young people who are trained in biology and want to make a difference, I think it's becoming increasingly clear that they want to work on things that matter to people. Um, and so really, I think it's all about people, Sue, and we're just very fortunate to be surrounded by such exceptional ones. Thanks, Jay. And Kate, I agree. I couldn't agree with the, with the comments that you made more. This is an exceptional place because of the people. And, uh, you know, it's, that's why we all stay here.
So I want to thank you both again. We'll have to wrap up our question and answer session now so we can get to our COVID-19 panel. But I really want to thank you both for and everyone in your labs for inviting us in, for playing Hollywood with us on our days with our with our film crews as we came through the lab. Um, it was a lot of fun and I really appreciate it. And I hope that um, all of our guests who are with us today enjoyed those videos and um, the, enjoyed the inside view of a couple of our labs at Mass General. So thanks Kate and Jay. And with that, I will, um, it's time for our COVID-19 panel. So we are thrilled to have Scott Esten, who is a longtime member of our Research Institute Advisory Council with us today to moderate this panel with four of our MJ, MGH research scholars. And uh, this will be followed by MGH, I'm sorry, this will be followed by a question and answer session with all of you. So again, I encourage you to use your Q&A button and um, get your questions ready because this is really going to be cutting edge. And I really, again, want to thank all of you who are listening today, who have supported the MGH Research Scholars Program. As I and every single one of these scientists you're about to hear from can attest, these awards alter the trajectory of our careers and they fuel extraordinary scientific discovery. So with that, Scott, take it away. Okay, thank you, Sue. Um, I'm happy to be part of Lab Day 2020, helping facilitate this really exciting discussion on COVID-19 research that addresses key healthcare issues at the top of a lot of people's minds. Uh, so as you said, my wife Pat and I are, have been early supporters of the Research Institute Scholars Program beginning almost 10 years ago, time flies, and have helped fund four research scholars. It's particularly gratifying for me to be with four of our 63 Research Institute Scholars for this panel today. So with that, let's get started and meet our panelists. Uh, Dr. Andrew Chan is a professor of medicine, Harvard Medical School, and he is the chief of the Clinical and Translational Epidemiology Unit and the Stuart and Suzanne Steele MGH Research Scholar, 2017 to 2022. Dr. Gleet Alter is Professor of Medicine, Harvard Medical School, a group leader of the Reagan Institute and the Christine and Bob Higgins MGH Research Scholar, 2012 to 2017, and the Samantha K MGH Research Scholar, 2017 to 2022. Dr. Rochelle Wodlinski. Dr. Uh, Rochelle is professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. She is the chief of the Division of Infectious Diseases in the Department of Medicine, also a physician investigator in the Medical Practice Evaluation Center, and the Steve and Deborah Gorlin, MGH Research Scholar, 2015 to 2020. And Dr. Luana Marcus. Luana, Luana is associate professor of psychology at Harvard Medical School and the director of the Community Pride Program and the Phyllis and Jerome Lyle Rappaport MGH Research Scholar 2020 to 2025. We prepared a question for each panelist to help you get familiar with our scientists and their area of expertise. Once we've heard from all four panelists, we'll open this up for audience questions and you can submit your questions using the Q&A button on your screen. I'll start with Andy. Your research has focused on studying large population groups to identify the frequency, patterns, risk factors, and lifestyle habits related to developing colorectal cancer, cancer and other digestive diseases. Early on in the pandemic, you led a team of scientists to launch the COVID Symptom Study, a smartphone app that collects data to understand COVID symptoms and track virus spread that, is now over, that now has over 4 million users. Please help us understand how COVID Symptom Study came to be and what you've learned. Thanks, Scott. I'm really glad to be here, and I'm really grateful for the opportunity to share the work we've done in response to COVID. As you mentioned, my lab is really focused on studying the epidemiology of chronic diseases like colorectal cancer. And so we use a variety of methods to collect information and data from patients and populations to really understand what are risk factors for developing cancer and how is it that we can best understand these risk factors to develop preventive interventions. I think when COVID hit though, we recognized that we needed to pivot quickly to really address this major public health pandemic and this public health threat, and also be creative about our approach to addressing it. We recognized very early that we understood extremely uh, little about the disease. There was very little data to go on, and a lot of what we were learning was really piecemeal from various parts of the world. 
So we felt it was important to develop a tool that could be rapidly deployed across a very large number of people in the population that was positioned to collect information on COVID uh, in real time and be able to take that information back, analyze the information, and then deliver that back to scientists and public health authorities, as well as the people that contributed to the app uh, in real time so that they could use the information to address the pandemic uh, right away. So this uh, is what led to our development of the COVID symptom study, which uses an app-based technology to allow people within the comfort of their own homes to download information about their risk factors for COVID, whether they've experienced any contact with individuals with COVID, and then whether they've developed symptoms of COVID and or if they've developed or had a test and the results of that test. And we ask people to share this information in a way that's convenient and easy to do, and also allows them to update their information on a regular basis, because we recognize that how, how fast moving the pandemic was and how we needed to have a dynamic approach to data with collection you know, over the course of, of several days um, and over the course of several months uh, as well. So it was very important to have this be rapid, flexible, and uh, allowed for, for many people to use across the country. And it's been a tremendous uh, success. We've had now across three different countries, nearly uh, four and a half people, uh, four and a half million people download the app and share information. And this has led to a variety of really important studies, which have allowed us to, for example, develop a predictive algorithm as to what symptoms predict the risk of developing COVID. This has been useful as a public health tool to help identify potential hotspots where COVID is likely to uh, develop in the near future. In addition, we've also used these as ways to develop a better understanding of, of risk factors for COVID, sort of what are things that predispose people for getting infection. And then finally, we've also been able to characterize better what symptoms lead to a diagnosis of COVID. So for example, very early on, we recognized that a loss of taste or smell was a really important predictor of who might go on the test positive. And we've been gratified to see that this uh, has been corroborated by other studies and has really led to, for example, the CDC and the WHO modifying their symptom criteria for testing and also modifying what doctors should be looking out for when it comes to COVID-19 as a potential diagnosis in their patients. So it's been a tremendous citizen science effort and allowed us to really demonstrate proof of principle that people can get involved in public health and it can have an enormous impact. Great, uh, thanks Andy. I particularly like that phrase, citizen science effort. That was, uh, that was good. Um, we're gonna get into some, go a little deeper in the science with Dr. Alter. Uh, Galit, you are in your own words, a pathogen chaser and has spent your career studying acute HIV, tuberculosis, influenza, malaria, Zika, and Ebola. Your lab's focus has shifted to studying SARS-CoV-2. Tell us about the proprietary technology that you've developed called system serology and how you're using this technology to improve both COVID diagnosis and vaccine development. Thank you very much. So um, going back to this pathogen chasing, you know, it was about 20 years ago that I was, um, you know, shocked by the devastation that HIV was causing. Um, and, you know, like Rochelle, I think we felt there was a calling to develop technologies to help us understand how we could counteract this devastating infection. But HIV was not alone. In the background of the devastation we were hearing about HIV, tuberculosis, malaria, Ebola, many other pathogens are ravaging the world. And so the immunology community, came together to begin to develop tools so we could understand that immune response that we need to harness in order to truly fight these pathogens and really put the fight on the side of humans and not allow these pathogens to cause disease. Now what that did is it started, it got us thinking about what was essential in the immune response. And the one thing that is key and the one thing that we've learned over the last 20 years from studying so many different pathogens is that antibodies are both the key to resolving infection, but also critical for preventing reinfect or infection upon re-exposure. And so tools to study how antibodies fight these pathogens really became clearly critical for helping us to frame and accelerate how we develop better therapeutics and vaccines. Now, while these 
omic technologies that you heard about from Jay and from Kate and from many others were exploding about two decades ago, what we lacked in the immunological toolkit was a tool that would allow us to understand how antibodies fight disease. Now, antibodies are the magic bullets that the immune system shoots to fight pathogens. And during an immune response, we make billions of bullets that simultaneously try to hit our pathogen in different ways. Now, each one of us will make different flavors of bullets, different kinds of bullets, different sizes of bullets that will hit our pathogen in different and magical um, uh, ways. And developing tools that allow us to understand which bullets work the best, which antibodies are truly protective, really became the key to developing a tool that we call system serology. Now, what the tool is, is really quite simple, and it is essentially a way to look very deeply and comprehensively at all the different magical antibodies that we make during an immune response. Coupled to artificial intelligence and machine learning, we're able to take this very deep immunological information and begin to understand at a minimal level what makes someone's antibodies more protective than another person's antibodies. Now, using those types of signatures, we can use this information now to understand how we can define early immunological responses to diseases like SARS-CoV-2 and define who is going to have a more benign trajectory, so a, a simpler asymptomatic trajectory versus other individuals who do not seem to develop these magic bullets that are able to effectively grab, control, and eliminate the pathogen. So starting in early February, when we started to see that this virus was starting to spread across the globe, what the lab began to do was to develop the tools and to repurpose the technology to rapidly begin to look at what was special about antibodies that were evolving in individuals who were somehow able to control or not control the infection. What we rapidly developed were A, tools that could allow us to see exactly who was infected and who was not, because the PCR test really only was um, able to detect individuals who were viremic for a short window of time. But secondly, what it allowed us to do using the system serology tool was to begin to develop patterns and to identify the profiles of antibodies in individuals who were coming in to the hospital from individuals who were going to essentially potentially succumb to that infection. So what we began to do was to use this information not only to guide the development of diagnostics to help us to support clinical care of these patients, to help us direct clinical care to support those individuals who needed care most, but to essentially use this information to guide vaccine development and vaccine evaluation. So now part of Operation Warp Speed, the laboratory supports the um, profiling of all the vaccines that are moving forward into human clinical testing as well as those that are in preclinical testing, essentially coming in the second wave of vaccines that will be used. And we're helping to use this information to also understand how monoclonal therapeutics, as well as other therapeutics that are poised to control this infection can be improved so that we can develop drugs and therapies to support our populations that are potentially exposed while we are waiting patiently for a vaccine to be safely approved for use across the entire population. That's it. Great, thanks, Dr. Alter. Um, continuing on vaccines, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, turn to Dr. Walensky. Uh, guests who attended Lab Day last fall will remember your work using microsimulation models to inform the development of large-scale clinical trials with the goal of improving HIV treatment and prevention. You are also the chief of the Division of Infectious Diseases at MGH, at Mass General, and in these last six months, you become a trusted information source here in Boston and around the world on mask safety, remdesivir use, and safe school reopening, among other community health issues. As you begin to prepare for the approval of a COVID-19 vaccine and Mass General's vaccine distribution, tell us about the key benchmarks and metrics you are evaluating to determine vaccine efficacy and safety. Thank you very much, Scott, um, and thanks for the opportunity to be here, and thank you so much for the MGH Research Scholar. Um, I can say, the Scholar Award, I can say that so much of the science that I have done over the last year related to COVID um, is completely unfunded by the NIH. Um, it's completely unfunded by any portfolio, but it is funded because of the work um, that I can do through the MGH Research Scholar. So for that, I am really grateful. Um, there are three large-scale phase three studies that are currently 
enrolling in this country for vaccines. Um, a fourth is on hold. Um, and we have a lot of work to do to think about how these will be rolled out in the weeks, and well, I would say in the months and perhaps years ahead. The National Academy of Medicine um, and Engineering and Science put forth their recommendations just this week um, about how we should be rolling these out. And thinking about this is, is, is going to be a truly extraordinary task. Um, you know, there are uh, several of these vaccines, probably the first two that we will hear about have a substantial cold chain challenge. They, they need to be um, frozen at minus 80 um, or minus 70. Um, and, and if thawed for longer than six hours, will need to be discarded. Um, they are also both uh, two doses. And so as we think about how we're going to roll out a, on a massive scale, um, not just 330 million vaccines, but two, 660 if we're doing it in two doses. And in fact, if we are distributing um, two different vaccines, you need to, of course, get the second dose of the same vaccine. So that implies an incredible amount of record, record keeping um, and information that we're going to need to maintain uh, among all of those who are vaccinated. How we are going to do that outside of healthcare settings in communities, the way we've been doing it in large scale, um, uh, the way we do influenza uh, screening is, is truly extraordinary. It, it will be an extraordinary task. Um, the Pfizer vaccine is a, a one dose vaccine, and uh, 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 sorry, the um, the J&J &J vaccine is a one-dose vaccine, um, and that is one that has just started in the last week or two in clinical trials in the United States. So it's a little bit further behind, but because it um, is only a one-dose vaccine, um, we may get results sooner around the same time that we will hear from the other two. Um, among the modeling efforts you heard last year, that my work is in, H it was in, is in HIV simulation and mathematical modeling, but um, vaccines are really ripe to model at a population level, and we can do modeling in that space as well. So ahead of these benchmarks, we can think through um, what would be the ideal vaccine and how do we scale it up? And when I think about this, I think about what if a vaccine worked to prevent disease in the person who was, in, uh, was vaccinated? What if it worked to um, decrease uh, the amount of symptoms in the person who is vaccinated or to diminish progression from um, mild disease to severe disease to critical disease? What if it decreased mortality? What if it did all of these things? Um, what if we had a really great vaccine in all of these parameters, but um, the coverage was so low because of trust? Or what if we couldn't scale it up at a rapid speed? And, and what difference does it make if we have a two-dose vaccine that requires, um, you know, perhaps a month to, re to reach immunity versus a one-dose vaccine that might require only two weeks. So we can work in all of those details in mathematical simulation models and understand truly what are the most important benchmarks. How is it that we are going to contain this disease using a vaccine um, at, ahead of those clinical trials to understand what is the most important thing that we need to do to scale up? Great, uh, thanks, Dr. Linsky. Uh, Dr. Marcus, you're a mental health clinician and researcher with expertise in anxiety and stress disorders, leading cutting edge research on building resiliency with disengaged and disconnected youth. Please help us understand the science of the stress people are experiencing in the pandemic. And what are some of the skills you've shared in the many webinars and videos that you've provided for the community on the internet? Thank you, Scott, and thank you, everybody. I'm really humbled to be an MGH um, research scholar. And it's been really a privileged time to receive this award, given that during this pandemic, mental health has become one of the primary topics. Our lab here really focused on implementation science. How do we get what works? How do we get what works here within the ivory tower of MGH to the streets, to the individuals that need the most? And so for the last many months, we've been really focusing on dissemination of what we know. So we've been focusing on how do we get skills to the regular person at home so that we can build resilience. And this is really important because what we know is anxiety and depression skyrocketing. Comparing to 2019, where we have 11% of the U.S. population reporting depression and anxiety, recent CDC reports suggest 41%. So it's really important for us to first understand what's happening to our brain. 
And very simply put, what happens is our brain's really smart and it's having a stress response given that we're all facing an invisible threat, COVID-19, in addition to many other threats. And so what happens is our limbic system, the emotional part of our brain kicks on, gets us ready to fight, fight, or freeze. So you might be feeling that heart pounding or tension. You may be feeling a little more irritable as a result of the chronic stress that we've been on for the last many months. So if we're talking about skills, we really want to be doing the opposite of that limbic response. We want to be cooling off our brain. And there are different ways to do it. I, I focus mostly on something called cognitive behavior therapy, an evidence-based, science-driven type of therapy that tells us how to activate our thinking brain. So one of the things I've been talking a lot with uh, my patients and over 70 webinars in the last six months is things like unplugging from the news. We all know that being plugged on in the news can really activate that limbic response. And in fact, research shown that after the marathon bombings in Boston, individuals that watched six or more hours of the news had actually a heightened stress response compared to those that were actually there during the event. So it's really important for us to think about unplugging from the news and anchoring on something that's soothing, something that's relaxing. I also think it's really important, and we all have heard this again and again, but the power of charging up and focusing on eating, sleeping, and exercise, those basics tend to be really forgotten in moments of acute stress and chronic stress. So those are the two skills that we've been talking about a lot. And if you're interested, we actually just launched a course called Mental Health for All. And you can see um, it on my website, drluana.com, which has several of the CBT skills. It was funded by a philanthropist, and so it's free for everybody in the world. And it's being translated to Spanish, Portuguese, and German currently. So I invite you to learn more about the skills through the website. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Dr. Marcus. So we're now going to turn to um, some questions from the audience, and I encourage everybody that does have a question, please just use the Q&A button and uh, send us your question. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll stay with you, though, Dr. Marcus, first. Um, we're hearing important stories about the disparities of COVID infection in under-resourced communities. Um, are you also seeing COVID-related mental health disparities in these communities? Absolutely, Scott. We've seen a lot of it um, during this pandemic. For example, here in our community of Chelsea, we've seen a huge increase in mental health needs, but the gap in access to mental health care has widened, given that a lot of the work that we've done has moved to remote. And a lot of our patients from our diverse communities really don't have access to a computer or um, to Zoom and are not able to access some of their cares. So not only we've seen an increase in need, but we've seen a significant difficulty. That's why we've done things like we created a summer scholarship program just for high school students to learn some of those skills and provided them with computers so that we could get more resilience built in our inner city. Great, thanks. Um, we've got two questions from the audience that I'm going to combine into one. I'm not sure who's uh, best to answer these. They're both, one's kind of um, uh, individual rated. Is the antibody response impacted by smoking and or obesity? And then um, maybe similarly, is there effect, does someone's blood type have an effect on um, kind of their ability to fight the virus? Maybe I can take that and maybe Rochelle, you've got some thoughts. Um, so, so the one thing that is clear is that um, obesity does alter the immune system and it alters the way that we respond to pathogens. And so we are beginning to do large scale clinical testing to begin to understand exactly what it is about obesity that may predispose individuals to different forms of immune control over the virus. One thing that is clear is that those billions of antibodies that one generates following infection are different in individuals with higher BMIs and individuals with lower BMIs. Why that is and how exactly um, BMI affects this immunological response to infection really is quite interesting and potentially might help us understand why with elevated BMIs, we are not only susceptible to elevated you know, probability of developing severe disease for SARS-CoV-2, but other infections as well, such as flu, respiratory syncytial virus, and many others that Rochelle can speak to. Um, but, but there is an interesting interaction. Smoking is a little bit more difficult because our 
communities here have a low um, level of smoking, so we've not been able to do those studies. But as we begin to partner with other communities around the country and as well as around the world, we'll begin to understand exactly how smoking can also affect this. But as Kate mentioned, it does affect the microbiome, which can then indirectly affect the immune system. Great. Rochelle, do you want to, can you take a question about someone's blood type or Galit, does that, um, can you do that? Yeah, do you know the answer? I um, know well, there, I do know, um, I think there's um, been hypothesis generating science that has demonstrated that some blood types are associated with better or worse outcomes and co-localization of some of the receptors to the virus. Um, I think right now that jury is still out. It's been hypothesis generating, but I don't think that the science is definitive in those spaces. So, so it's really interesting, right? So blood type is made by sugars. So it's a combination of sugars we put on all of our cells in our body. So A, B, and O is just a different assortment of three little sugar, one of which is called sialic acid. Now that sialic acid is used by viruses to roll on um, epithelial cells. And so before the virus hits its actual receptor, which is called ACE2, it actually uses sugars on the surface of cells to roll, attach, and form interactions much more uh, tightly. And so what it turns out is that because blood groups are essentially this arrangement of sugars, there are some blood groups that the virus seems to roll better on. And that is the basis for why we think that this sugar, that the essentially different blood groups might make certain groups or individuals more susceptible because the virus might have a, a little bit better ability to stick on to the surface of the cells to then find its receptor that it can actually bind to. Um, that effect, as Rochelle said, is now being validated in additional large genome-wide association studies because it came out in one study. Um, and the molecular basis for why it is that this rolling really varies so dramatically across the blood groups is really what is being mechanistically dissected currently. But it's a really interesting phenomenon, and I think it just highlights the importance not only of DNA and proteins in our system, but also sugars that pathogens love to use in order to get a handle um, on our, our cells. That's uh, interesting. Great, thanks. Um, I just had a lot of good questions. Um, just to add something to that, sure. uh, Galit just mentioned about obesity. Just um, you know, what we're also I think learning, and there's emerging data to support, is that it's not just obesity per se that might affect uh, whether someone's more susceptible to COVID and/or will respond to a vaccine, but also potentially what they're eating and their diet. So. Mm -hmm. I think that there's uh, emerging information that diet quality may be an important predictor of infection risk and progression of infection you know, if someone does get sick. Um, so that's one of the things that we're actively studying through the app. We actually recently launched a diet survey for participants to provide information on their diet. And we'll try to assess that using a dietary score to determine what their diet quality is and how that links to disease. And then kind of going back to Gleed and what, um, what uh, Kate mentioned before, this all may link, link to the microbiome. Um, and there is, I think, very uh, solid data that the microbiome influences immunological responses. So within a subset of people that are using our app and are in our studies, we're also collecting you know, microbiome specimens to link all this information together. So I think it's a good example of how, I think the work even amongst the scholars here are, are kind of, you know, uh, 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 are things that kind of mesh together and complement each other really well. Uh, thanks, Andy, that's, yeah, uh, that's an interesting uh, observation. Um, we've got time for maybe two more questions. I've got two or three really good ones. Um, after a vaccine or a therapeutic drug has been approved, how significant is the risk of negative long-term consequences from the vaccine or drug? Maybe I'll just take that and say, um, there haven't been a lot of vaccines that have large scale long-term risks. So we uh, certainly it's theoretical, we're only gonna have six months worth of follow-up data, but most of the data from these vaccines over the long-term are demonstrated as pretty safe. Um, I can think of a few examples where, where there are rare events that occur with, um, with vaccination. But for the most part, um, it is very much thought that given the history um, that those that of, of uh, viral vaccines being quite safe, there is 
more concern about the risk of, of the disease than there is the risk of the virus. Um, or than the risk of the vaccine, I'm sorry. But I, I do see another question in the chat and maybe um, this will relate to that. And that is for two of our three front runners right now, we have never had a vaccine. They're mRNA vaccines. We've never had a vaccine um, of, in these spaces um, that use these mechanisms. And so I do think that there's some uncharted waters here that, that we have to sort of there's gonna be some length of faith and some learning. Um, but I do believe that if those are the candidates that move forward, it will be generally thought that the, the vaccines themselves will be more beneficial than the long-term risk. Great, um, a quick one. Uh, will MGH be doing vaccinations for the general public when available? I would imagine so. I think we're we're months from that, if not, I hate to say it, years from that. Um, and I can't imagine that MGH won't be central to any um, local statewide um, effort. Um, we are uh, working towards um, one of the vaccine trials, which we're hoping to open in the next weeks. Um, and I suspect we are going to be knee deep in, involved in vaccinating not only our healthcare workforce, but our community. Great. Uh, Andy, you've got a potential, I think, uh, new user of the app. Uh, one of our uh, members of the audience wants to know the name of the app. Uh, it's called the COVID Symptom Study. And the easiest place to find it is if you go to co uh, uh, covid.joinzoe.com, which I can, um, I guess, try to put in the Q&A as a response. Um, uh, and it's a really easy thing for anyone to download. And so we encourage people at home to do it and friends and family. Okay. I have Believe a quick thing, Scott, about the um, side effects. I think this is just really important. I think that, you know, we have, um, you know, decades of data on vaccines and monoclonal therapeutics that have clearly demonstrated that there really are no long-term consequences. These are incredibly effective, very safe interventions. And unfortunately, due to some, you know, um, uninformed, publicity, um, there have been some, you know, conversations in the media that have been incredibly counterproductive. Um, I think that what we have to do is we have to ground ourselves in science. And the science speaks extremely clearly about vaccines and therapeutics in their ability to counteract in a very specific way, the pathogens that we target. Now, I do want to speak to some of the experimental platforms because as somebody else mentioned in the chat, you know, this is the first time we're using RNA. RNA is incredibly safe. RNA has been in humans for many other indications. We do enzyme replacement therapy with RNA. We know that RNA is a very um, a safe uh, platform. The issue right now is we're talking essentially about changing the way we do vaccines, right? So in the context of an epidemic where we need to respond, or a pandemic, we need to respond with the speed we've had to respond here, some of the older, um, I should say more antiquated platforms that we've used traditionally for making flu vaccine and other vaccines really take too long. The time it takes to make the proteins, to quality control the proteins, to bottle the proteins, it just takes an awful long time. They're very effective, but these are you know, technologies that Pasteur invented in the late 1800s. RNA represents the newest technology. It is fast. It is completely programmable. And so where we really are with RNA today is in this incredibly safe technolo technological space that can move faster than any other technology we have for vaccines. And the question now is just understanding how we can deploy it fast enough. Because what Rochelle mentioned, the cold chain issue is really one of our biggest limitations in getting RNA to the masses. But the beautiful thing is with chemistry, with you know, all the chemists in the Boston area and many other places around the world, biologists, immunologists, vaccinologists, and clinicians, we are gonna learn how to make RNA the next generation and next phase of vaccines that will be safe and you know, immediately available to almost any pathogen in a precision medicine type approach. Great, uh, uh, thanks Galit. Um, I love your enthusiasm, everybody's enthusiasm and wanna say thanks um, uh, for myself and maybe representing everybody else for uh, all the effort um, and energy that you're putting into this. Uh, and I also appreciate all the questions from the audience. So I think we're ready to turn back over to you, Sue, um, to wrap up. 
Thanks so much, Scott. And thanks, thanks so much for moderating the panel and thanks to all of our panelists for that inside view into the latest COVID research. And I guess if there's, when I listen to them speak and if there's one message I have for all of you, our special friends of research at Mass General, it's to try to listen to the scientists, understand what science is trying to um, tell us about the, the right path forward. And I think that we won't go wrong. So um, to all of you, we're delighted that you joined us today. Uh, this has been a remarkably quick 90 minutes. Um, it, it, I can't believe it went by so quick, but I hope that you all learned something and that um, you will uh, stay in touch with us. So to all of you who have supported the MGH Research Scholars Program, the incredible science that you heard today would not have happened without this amazing support. Um, we, and I just have to speak on behalf of all of the scientists you heard from today and the other uh, you know, 60 plus MGH research scholars that it, this, these awards, as I said earlier, really changed the trajectory of careers. So we would love all of you to keep in touch with the Mass General Research Institute. So I'm going to ask you to look at the back of your program and um, you'll see that we've listed several ways for you to do just that. So you'll see on the back of the program there that next week we're hosting our first virtual science slam, which we've dubbed the Grand Slam because it has a baseball theme. And this will take place on October 14th from four to five. We'd be delighted to have all of you join us virtually. And if you're not sure what a science slam is, this is a great way for you to become acquainted. I'll be honest, we typically do it in a bar and um, it's a lot of fun, but really are we, we challenge our researchers to try to talk about their science to a lay audience in just a few minutes. So again, this is a lot of fun and we're doing it virtually for the first time. So I hope that you can try to join us. You can also follow us on social media. Uh, you could follow the scientists across the Research Institute. And currently we're running our 2020 Mass General Research Institute image contest on Facebook. So there's over 50 images, uh, research images of all different types of science that are up there that people have submitted. And so we really hope that you'll get onto Facebook and look at those images and vote for your favorite. You can also subscribe to our quarterly MGH Research Scholars Notebook publication, which will deliver um, news about philanthropy-fueled discovery straight to your inbox, and that's all is very informative. So my colleague, Mary Ryan, is happy to be your point person on any of these opportunities, and her contact information is at the bottom of that page at the back of your program. So I would really encourage you to get in touch with her if you're interested in joining any of those things that I just mentioned. And if you're interested in learning more about the MGH Research Scholars Program, please get in touch with my colleague, Kate Gutierrez, whose information is also on the back of your program. So as I mentioned, next week, we'll be sending you an email with a complete lab day recording. And we really encourage you to share this with your networks. As they say every year at Lab Day, you are all now ambassadors for the Mass General Research Institute. So please help us spread the word. So it's now time for us to go, but I remind you that we would love to hear from all of you. Please let us know your thoughts on our virtual Lab Day, or if other questions came up today that maybe we can answer, reach out. We'll try to answer all of your questions. We're really grateful for your time and um, for the terrific questions that you sent in today. And we're really looking forward to the time that we can host you again in person on campus in our research labs at Mass General. Um, and uh, hopefully uh, with all of the scientists working hard, uh, we will be getting there soon. So um, I hope to see you all at another Research Institute event very soon. I hope you have a lovely afternoon and cheers with your Research Institute mug, and um, we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone.